Recording. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Gina Lazenby. I'd like you to welcome you to our Conscious Cafe Global Evening tonight. Uh, we have as our guest speaker, Malcolm Stern. Welcome, Malcolm. And um, we have a slightly different format tonight where we're going to be a little bit more a conversation. Uh, Conscious Cafe is an organization that uh, was started by Judy Piatkus, who's with us on, on our call tonight. Um, eight, nine years ago, it was a place for conversation and community where we could talk about things that matter. And in those nine years, we've very much been meeting as live in-person groups in community. And of course, this year it's all changed. So many of those conversations are online. Um, we have a number of regional groups. I'm a Skipton group in the north with Cora, who's here from um, <clears throat> Salisbury. St. Uh, St. Albans, New Forest. We have a number of UK groups. We also have groups in Singapore, Geneva, uh, France, uh, and in Rome. Uh, you can find out more on ConsciousCafe.org website. All the recordings of previous event tonight's been recorded uh, will be on the, that website. Uh, we'll send you a link for what we're going to talk about tonight. And you can find out more about, about the groups. So tonight, uh, Malcolm's going to be talking about um, how to be your own psychotherapist. This is an interesting invitation, this is. So let me tell you a little bit about Malcolm. I know a lot of you know him. Malcolm originally trained in humanistic psychology and has been seeing groups, couples and individuals for well over 30 years. He's co-director and co-founder of Alternatives at St. James's Piccadilly in London and runs psychotherapy groups internationally. He co-presented the Channel 4 series on relationships made for each other uh, in 2003 and 2004. And this book that he's brought out just in the last month or so is called Slay Your Dragons with Compassion, 10 Ways to Thrive Even When It Feels Impossible. And this is um, Malcolm's third book. Now I know Malcolm loves working with groups and so therefore he doesn't much have a grand plan for tonight as a, a plan for seeing what comes up. That's why the invitation earlier was for you to put your camera on so that we can see who's here and he'll just work with the energy of tonight what comes up and so I'm going to invite uh, Malcolm to start but I'm going to uh, ask Malcolm some questions. Uh, he said that he's going to talk about five of those 10 uh, key areas from his book. And I'm, Malcolm, I'm just going to start by asking you, um, you uh, you've mentioned in interviews that you've done that the book was, if not the word inspired, then triggered by the tragic death of your daughter, Melissa, who committed suicide. And then you have written this book. So can you share a little bit about the process that you must have gone through in, in the grief that you had to writing this book, which is, which is out now? Well, I think if you use the right word with inspired, actually, I mean, even though it's a tragic event, mm. we can take inspiration from anything in our lives, really. And um, it was really, I think when we get a hammer blow like that, we, we have the choice to either rise or to, to sink. And um, I had some very useful um, advice and support along the way. So it was, it was, um, it was really, really great because um, I, I knew that I wasn't alone. And bit by bit over the years, what I've done is I've synthesized what are the, what are the different skills I already had and have developed in order to deal with this tragedy. And, um, and so, I, you know, Slay Your Dragons With Compassion was born when um, uh, Ben Crave and I um, decided to who's who was um, um, in, in one of my groups some time ago, but he's, a, he's an editor and a writer. We got together and, and actually sort of um, knocked up um, the story of many of the, the groups. So there are stories from the groups. In fact, there are people here whose stories are actually in the book. I won't out you, don't worry. Um, and, and also, but there's, there's also my own personal story. And I've, bit by bit, I've gone along and seen that this is, this is my legacy. This is, this is 35 years of running groups. Mm -hmm. and, and also what I've developed into in the process. And when my daughter saw I'd advertised on Facebook as my legacy, she said, um, she said, Dad, you don't do legacies till after you're dead. She said, you're the most arrogant man. Um, but I'm hoping that I'm, I'm not that and that actually um, something has come through me. And I, the first two books I wrote, which were both written for Judy, and Judy actually launched me on this, this path of writing books. So Judy, many thanks to you. Um, and actually when I wrote my first book, 
I, I went to loads of publishers and all of them said, um, no, I don't think you've got it. And, and actually when I went to Judy, they said, well, there's eight books here. Now you've got to synthesize this down into one. And that was so helpful to get caring and advice um, from um, in the process. So I, I, I wrote my first couple of books and they were hard work. I had to really dredge something out. But something about this book just surged through. And so I feel like what I've done here is I've actually looked at what are the practices we can do that can help us to support us in difficult times. Now, coronavirus is, is I mean, I, I read something the other, the other day, which was really interesting. It said, you know, we've lived through this or in, uh, in, the, in the last 200 years, we've gone through world wars. We've gone through the Spanish flu, which killed 300 million people. Um, we've gone through all sorts of, of hellish events. Uh, and, and, and actually, I think we've been, we're, we're in a reset now. I'm not going to go into coronavirus in a big way. We've all got lots of thoughts around it. And I don't want the evening to be about the coronavirus. But this is something that's actually in our, in our sphere now, that actually we have been forced to make a change. And one thing that's happened to me is that I've decided to move to Totnes. Um, and I'd always thought I might. Um, I lived there for quite some time and I own a flat there. And, and actually, when, I, when I, I got the virus in March, and when I was during this period of lockdown, I thought, I realised what I want is nature. So I'm, I, it's forced me into a shift. And, um, and what I'm interested in tonight is in taking a look at what we've done or, or what we can do. And, and I've, we've, we've, we've synthesised about five of the, um, of the different practices that are in the book. And I think with those practices, because I think that life is about a series of practices, we can do all we like about, you know, um, trying to meditate for, you know, 24 hours a day for, for months and months or something like that. It's not going to work. But if we can take on practices in our life and actually start to adapt and build them into our lives, they're simple, really. It's just about, you know, for me, one of the most simple and brilliant statements was the Dalai Lama statement about religion. He said, my religion is kindness. There's your practice straight off. Are we going to be are we going to practice kindness? So, but what I'd like to do is to look at um, some of the practices that, 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 that have been in my book. So the first of the practices, the first of the chapters is called Bearing Witness. So um, right now, let's just focus. So let's really take a moment to just use our breath. And right now I've got the spotlight, not because I'm a major egotist, but I am, but it's like, that's not the reason I'm, I'm setting you this right now. But it's just like, can you at this stage really bring me your attention? So if you're thinking, well, I'm going to have the dinner later or uh, what did I do today? Just bring your attention back to practice in this place of being present. And Eckhart Tolle has made a, a, a living and a lifestyle and, and a, sort of a, a sort of a revolutionary path out of just the simple thing of being present. And as you're present, notice your body, notice your shoulders, notice your jaw, notice your belly. Notice your eyes and then just soften everything. And so you notice that even in that process, even in the last few seconds, there's a, there's a quiet, there's a silence in the room. And I think that there's a real call for that. We us do that every day. So I went out for lunch yesterday with a friend of mine um, and um, we drove to St. John's Wood uh, because she didn't want to use public transport. And, um, and, and she drove around for an hour and a half because we couldn't find a parking spot. And um, I noticed myself becoming more and more agitated until I noticed that I was becoming agitated. And then I just thought, we're just driving around. She wants to do, to, to find a parking space. In the end, we gave up and went to West Hampstead, but um, that, that wasn't really the point. The point was that I noticed my in, inability and unwillingness to be present with what was. And what was, was I was hanging out with a friend in her very nice car and, uh, and, and actually um, getting agitated because I wanted to arrive where I was going and that wasn't what was happening. So we can notice when we're doing different things about what it is that, that's stopping us from being present and, and the stories that we tell ourselves. So another of the um, practices that we've looked at um, um, is um, in fact, um, Gina, can you call me out the five? I think I've got, I think they've got one is slay your dragons with compassion. One is... <clears throat> I've got first one I've got on, on that list is bear witness. The second one was about intuition, finding your radar using what you call that sixth sense intuition. 
yeah, so that's a, that's a very powerful one. So I've been running groups now for, for 35 years odd, odd. By the way, we are going to go into small groups at some point. And I, it's very, I, what I've loved about Conscious Cafe, and I started going quite early on when Judy was running these, um, was that, um, is, is, is this, this sort of connection with others of like mind. I'm going to come to that with um, mm -hmm. creating a Sangha in, in a while. But mm -hmm. first, let me just take a look at finding your radar, because this is a really interesting one. We are brought up, or we have brought ourselves up, or we have got into a situation where we are very left brain orientated. We're very logically orientated. We try and think our way through the scenarios that confront us and confound us. And what we end up doing is often going round in circles. And I've found myself often having, you know, near sleepless nights because something has, has agitated me and I haven't been able to find the still small voice within. And uh, I'm really interested in that still small voice within. So what's happened for me in the process of running groups for these last three decades is that I am constantly having to follow my radar. And it might well be that Logically, I feel like I ought to be thinking something other than what I'm thinking or following a different path. But actually, if I tune in, if I slow down, and slowing down is a big key to all of this. If I slow down enough, then I'm going to find that actually there's an instinct about what to do. So sometimes I'll be working with some. There's a lot of people here in this room tonight who've been on, on one year groups with me and are still in one year groups with me, some of, some of you who are here. And um, I won't out you, it's all right. Um, but um, so, so what you've seen is, is the way that I work. And what I'm really interested in is this, is this sixth sense or this intuition or what I've called in the book, the, our radar. When we learn to follow our radar, it's a bit like flexing a muscle. And what I've seen again and again in groups is I use this muscle all the time. And therefore the muscle becomes strong. But very often we disregard our radar, our sixth sense. And our sixth sense is every bit as palpable and as real as the other five, we disregard our radar. And in the disregarding of it, we think our way through the scenarios we're in. Little knowing that there is inside us, inside every one of us, there is genius. And it's okay. hard to imagine looking at some of you that there's genius in there, but I promise you that there is. Um, every single one of us has, uh, sorry, my humor's quite weird, so you might think I'm rude, but um, um, I hope you'll see me as humorous. Um, but you might see that actually, um, that you have inside you something extremely um, um, wise and you've been able to access that, that at odd times often it comes at periods of crisis or it comes at periods where we've we've got no escape that's visible from a scenario we're in and we have to find a different way through but sometimes it'll come just in the process of of just going okay well what's my radar saying well, you know, and, and and actually you can't even go what's my radar saying because then you're trying to bring it to the logical mind what you're trying to do is to tune in. And those of you who are in the room, there's quite a few of you I know who are therapists here in this room. You're often using, a good therapist will be using their radar all the time. You'll be navigating with your radar. You won't, and I often see this at alternatives when we put on talks. If someone comes with a written out speech, I guarantee you that that speech is not gonna be very interesting because they're not relating, they're not in the moment, they're not relating to what's in front of them. What they're relating to is their concept of what they want to present which has very little to do with the people who are listening to them. So I'm, as, as Gina said before, I'm tuning into the group, you know, and I've watched Eckhart is a genius of this, Eckhart Toller is an absolute genius of this. He's, he just, he's always tuning to what's going on in the room and that's where he's bringing his attention. And I was very fortunate to study at one time with a woman called Barbara, uh, um, sorry, um, June Tweedy, what's her name? Uh, not June Tweedy, uh, um, Mrs. Tweedy, Irina Tweedy. And, uh, she, Irina Tweedy wrote a book called The Chasm of Fire and at the age of 80 she was initiated by her Sufi master in, in, uh, in, um, in, in Iran and was put through a whole series of, and came back as a great teacher and I used to go on a Friday night to her meditations and she would have conversations with people and I'd hear them and I know that she was saying something I needed to hear and this was happening all around the room and all these weird mystical things were happening and at the time I just thought that's normal. Um, but actually she was tuning in at a very deep level to what was inside. There was no intellect in there. It was a little old lady of 80 who was just doing her thing. But there was such profundity in that space because she had absolutely affected the following of the radar. And again, one of my great teachers, Ram Das, was also someone who um, would always tune into what was going on. And there was always compassion and wisdom in there.
So our radar, our sixth sense is, is a really profound part of us. And um, I'm, just, I'm going to dream up the exercise as we go along that we're going to put you into groups to do. But I'm going to take you through the other three things that, I, that we're going to do. And then I'm going to put you in small groups and then we're going to come back and, and debrief some of what's arisen. So we'll have a conversation after that. So the third one, um, uh, Gina, is... The third one I've got uh, is about upgrading your relationships, learning from them. Can I ask a question about the radar? Yeah, of course. Well, if somebody's not familiar with doing that, how do they validate what you're talking about? How do they begin to do that? How do you know that there is a valid voice if you're not taught to do that, if you're not brought up with that? How do you begin to tune into it? Or is that too big a question now? No, it's not too big a question. Um, it's a bit like... Um, it's a bit like when you play tennis. I'm just thinking of the tennis analogy because... Uh, I know my friend Claire here, who's a very keen tennis player. Um, it's a bit like when you play tennis. You know when you've hit the sweet spot on the racket. You know when absolutely you've followed through with something. And so there's something about trusting. The, the, the radar lands a very clear note when you're in tune. Sometimes it'll be fuzzy, but sometimes there'll be a really clear note. And it's learning to trust that clear note. Because absolutely underneath this, this mass of hip of neuroses and, and ailments that we, uh, we have as human beings, there is also um, a, the connection with the divine, the connection with our essence and our spirit. And for me, that, the, the radar comes through our connection with the universal whole. So um, Carl Jung said that um, everything is synchronicity. So that everything's crossing our path in order for us to find um, the, um, the, the what is synchronous for us. And I know that often I've come across the right situation at the right time. I've met the right person at the right time. Now we can get all, we can get all mystical about this and go that we're constantly looking in a sort of like a bewildered state for, um, for um, clues from our radar. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is that actually when you slow down and slow is really useful. Uh, my favorite singer, Leonard Cohen, I wrote a song called, I would bring him into it all, I see Tracy smiling there. Um, but my favorite singer, he, um, he's, he did a song, I've, I've always liked it slow. And, and I've really got to, um, to understand that, that when I want to use my radar well, I will slow down. Because if I'm quick, I'm trying to crack through something. But if I'm slow, I'm allowing space for something to come through me. So, okay, so the third is let your relationships educate you. Well, yeah. um, just before I wrote my um, first book for Judy, I was gonna write a book um, called um, uh, The Yoga of Relationships. Um, at, or, and, and that was, for me, it was West, Western man, woman, have um, a different path than the East, which we've tried so hard to follow. Um, and the, in the East, there's, but meditation is very much a part of, of everyday life. But in the, in the West, we have different structures. I don't think we're cut out in the same way for meditation. I think some of us are, but a lot of us aren't. But there are other things that can, that can be profound teachers. And for me, that process of relationship is where the profundity of teaching comes. Because um, I remember Ramdas saying once to me, um, uh, that he said, um, if I start to believe what people say about me, i.e. that I'm enlightened, I'm a, I'm a great being and blah, 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 and all the rest of it, he said, all I have to do is be in a relationship for six months. And it's true, you can't hide in a relationship, in a, in a relationship because you're a, you're a mixture of all sorts of things. You're going to be this, you, what I like to look at is, is, the, is the model that each of us have a tribe within us. This is like sub-personalities and you'll see this in psychosynthesis. And there are different members of the tribe. So for, for um, I remember working with Barbara Summers who did um, um, transpersonal psychology um, and Ian Gordon Brown. And she talked about a woman having a palette, a, a seven different dresses that she would wear for the different sub, sub, different sub personalities. So there would be the structress, there would be the young girl, there would be the crone, there would be the, um, um, the wise woman, there would be the sort of like the, um, um, I can't remember what the others were, but, but yes, what she said is that we can be taken, taken over by those, we can find ourselves in those sub personalities, or we can actually choose to actually recognize which sub-personality is in play. So in a relationship, sometimes your absolutely foul, revolting self will be there. And it's there for all of you. I was listening to um, Jack Cornfield the other day and um, 
and he was talking about, um, he, he asked a question of the, in, in a room, it was, it was a, a recording of a lecture he'd given, he said, now which of you, which of you have been in ridiculous sexual experiences? He said, don't bother to raise your hands, all of you have. And he's right, we've, we've all sort of at times gone to lunacy in terms of our relationships. We've been, we've been pulled. Um, and what I call um, falling in love is the temporary lifting of critical faculties. And, um, and so what often happens when we fall in love is, and I think it's a brilliant confidence trick of the universe, it puts us into another human being in a way that, you know, if we were really to see what a mess it is we're, in, we're relating to, we wouldn't dream of getting in to the point where it's very difficult to unravel from that relationship. But actually what happens in relationships is we often we fall in love and any imbecile can fall in love. So that's not exactly a great skill. It's like you fall in love and it's not like, wow, what an extraordinary human being you must be to have fallen in love. Actually, you've just fallen down a manhole or you've just fallen up a manhole. I don't know which it is. But when you fall in love, it's like the other person is the, is the divine. And you enter into a stage of cosmic consciousness often where it's so perfect and you think it can never end. And you think that you've found your soulmate, but your soulmate often becomes your cellmate. Um, as, as they start to show up with the other parts of them, they're no longer this exquisite being that you thought they were. They are that, but they're also other things. And for me, the process of loving another human being and Rainer Maria Rilke, the great German sage and poet and writer, said that if in your lifetime you can love one other human being, you have achieved a great deal. And so there's something about love, which is a practice. And when we're in relationship, we're in a practice with another. Can we take the next hurdle with that person? Can we handle being with who they are for all of the different facets of them? Can you practice tolerance? Can you practice kindness? Can you practice listening? Can you practice presence? These are the things that happen within relationships that give us an opportunity to go beyond our everyday self. And uh, when I've listened to Eckhart talk about relationships, he said, well, he said, you can, you can avoid relationships, but actually that doesn't, do, that doesn't do the trick either. Actually, it's going through the fire that actually causes us to, to get somewhere. So I think for all of us, relationships have the capacity to wake us up. And even the really difficult ones, we're having to confront a different part of ourselves. So if I look at someone, for example, who's been abused, they're a player in that as well. I'm not saying they've brought it on themselves. Mm. I'm saying that there's something in them to look at. What is it in you that's drawing someone who's abusive? What is it in you that's drawing someone who's cruel? And actually, when I look at the facets of relationship, I see some of them. I remember when I was an estate agent many, many years ago. Um, but when I was an estate agent, I remember... Um, my secretary, who was in her 50s and I was in my 20s, she said, you know, she said the greatest gift in relationships is companionship. And I thought, you boring old fart. Um, but actually, as I've aged, I've actually recognised that having a deep companionship with another is a profound experience. And that's something that, that gets built on our ability to tolerate, to be kind, to accept the other for who they are, to be willing to, to show our vulnerability. These are the facets of relationship. Can we bring those to a relationship? And in order for a relationship to work, um, th th there are four levels of relationship. But I, this is the model that I've developed and, and, um, and use. There's the, um, there's the physical. So you have to have at least some connection with the physical. Um, it, for me, it's very difficult for a relationship to work if there's no ability to be, to be lovers, for example. Um, that is one of the, the, the keys within relationship. And then there's also something about being in the physical about being in the world together so if you're going to different um, events together if you're out there in the world together if you feel like you know that you want to go and see an opera and your and your partner wants to go and see a, a pantomime and and actually you can't really be in the world together so your interests aren't the same then there's a difficulty in forging the relationship but if the, you need the physical and then you need the mental there has to be some sense of being challenged at an intellectual level by the person that you're with. So um, th again, there's something profound about having someone to bounce off, to actually explore our thinking, to explore who it is we are, to explore the wisdom of what we inhabit. The third place is the, is the emotional. And <clears throat> for me in relationships, if we can dare show our vulnerability and our grief, they're the places we tend to avoid most. Depending on our family's surroundings, it might be that we avoid our, um, our anger a lot because in our family, perhaps we were told, don't get angry. So you end up trying to be nice and nice in relationships is dead. 
Um, but anger that's just splashing all over the place is another extreme as well. And the Buddhists talk about the middle way. So there's something about learning to be with our emotions and for us being willing to, to be with another's emotions. Can you actually stay present in the face of your partner's anger? Can you stay present in the face of their grief without wanting to fix them? Which is what we often want to do is we want to fix them so we don't have to face the pain of it as, as well. Um, and I was talking to a client this morning who'd lost his son. And, um, and he was saying that when he lost his son, he recognized there were a lot of people who, who tried to give him answers. And that was the last thing he needed. What he needed was people to go with him. And I know that um, for me, when I lost Melissa, I didn't need people to tell me that the answers, there weren't any answers. But I needed people who were willing to actually be with me in the room, in the face of my grief, in the face of my profound disbelief in the process that was around. And for me, that's relationship skills. Or can we be with another when they are going through something profound and powerful without running away? That doesn't mean we can't say, I'm finding this tough, but it means you stay present and you stay in the room. And it might even be that you leave the room. Maybe you say, actually, I feel overwhelmed. I'm taking 10 minutes out, but I will come back rather than, than I'm overwhelmed, fuck you, I'm leaving. Um, so so you're, you're, you're navigating your ground and you're creating your ground together. I mean, obviously I'm giving you snippets of these, these five different things, but I just want to give you enough material that you can take a look at when we go into the small groups at, um, at that where you show up in some, or, or any of that have resonated with you. So the fourth of these, Gina, was... The fourth one <clears throat> is when you talked about Sangha, community like-minded, which is very much like we're here, isn't it? Unconscious Cafe. that has been a sustenance for me, finding those like minds, Sangha. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the most important things in our lives, actually. But if we are, if we're not with people who get us to where we can actually truly show up with who we are and not have to hide behind a disguise where we're bringing our so-called best self, then we feel much more able to navigate to down to our depths and find out who it is we, we, we are. And a Sangha is originally, um, in fact, I'm going to read you a little bit for Thich Nhat Hanh wrote about a Sangha because he's just extraordinary. And um, Thich Nhat Hanh is a, is a Buddhist monk who um, um, was nominated by Martin Luther King in the 1960s for the Nobel Prize for peace, um, for his, um, his statement that um, uh, nonviolent resistance was what was needed in relation to the Americans rather than trying to work our way through this. So, um, so this is what Thich Nhat Hanh writes about um, Sangha in, the, in, in his um, book, Friends on the Path, Living Spiritual Communities. And by the way, if you haven't come across Thich Nhat Hanh, really, he is a, a living master. He's, he's quite close to the end of his days now, but he is a true master. And I've seen, been around him a number of times. By the way, it's very easy to give away our goal and go, ah, oh, master, there you go. This, this wonderful human being. And mostly, um, you're just seeing one side of them. But there is something about having really developed ourselves over a lifetime that can often bring about mastery. Anyway, this is what Thich Nhat Hanh says. Sangha is more than a community. It's a deep spiritual practice. A, a Sangha is a community of friends practicing the Dharma together in order to bring about and contain awareness. The essence of a Sangha is awareness, understanding, acceptance, harmony, and love. When you do not see this in a community, it is not a true Sangha. And I feel like in these times, it is so essential to gather together, as we're doing here. You know, I think that Judy has created a lighthouse with them, mm. um, with, with Unconscious Cathy, in the same way as I think that unconsciously I created a lighthouse with alternatives, and Findhorn have created a lighthouse with the Findhorn community. There are lighthouses around the planet which are feeding people, and they're places where we can go to, to, be, um, to recover. There's a woman called Beatrice Birch in Canada who's been working with addicts and with, um, um, with people with um, serious drug addiction problems. And people go to, go to her home for a year and she takes them through a process. And there's something about creating the Sangha there where we can start to heal. But for me, even having that, um, well, I very rarely quote the Bible, but I'll try it just for this moment. Um, and, and one of the biblical quotes is, when two or more are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. And, and there is something about going, getting together with other people of like mind so that we are in a place where we're practicing authenticity and awareness. 
Okay, thank you. So I think the final one was Slay Your Dragons with Compassion. Uh, the final one is um, Slay Your Dragons with Compassion, How to Face Ourselves and Others with Authenticity and Integrity. Okay, so um, for me, this is at the essence of the book. And it's really interesting because there's, there's very little I'll fight for. And uh, my, my editor wrote to me today just saying, uh, you know, I've been, I was so moved seeing, I did an interview on Sky News where I spoke about the, um, the book. And he said, I was so moved seeing that. And I was so pleased to play a part, even though it was a, a tiny one. And I wrote back to him and said, Adam, it wasn't a tiny one. You actually had my back. The, 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 you know, they didn't like my title. They didn't like Say Your Dragons with Compassion. And those of you who've worked with me, will know that I've been using that, that terminology for decades. It's been something that, I, that has actually sprung to me, that actually we do have to confront the places that need confronting, but we do have to do this in a, um, in a wise and compassionate way. And um, for me, there are two golden rules in slaying your dragons with compassion. One is you speak your truth. You always speak your truth. And two is you never hurt another more than is necessary. So I went to a wedding once in, uh, in Richmond Common, a very happy to be wedding. And, um, and uh, one of the vows that they made at this wedding was we will hurt each other. I thought that's an interesting vow. And then they said, and we, we vow to clear up the messes when we do that. So if you're going to be in a deep relationship with another human being, you are guaranteed to cause hurt to them. If you're going to be in a relationship with your children, you are guaranteed to cause hurt to them. If you're going to be in a relationship with your parents, you're guaranteed to cause hurt to them. It will happen. There will be conflict at times. But actually, if we can really stand in the face of our truth without making the other wrong, and one of the practices I've used a lot around this area is not to use pejoratives. So um, a friend of mine rang me up the other day and said, oh, I'm so fed up with my wife. She's, um, she's so selfish. And I said, while you're using that pejorative, you've got no chance. Um, because if you're going to label her and want to put her in that box of selfish, then she's just going to, you know, absolutely sort of re be repelled by what you're saying. Actually, what you can talk about if you're feeling hurt, and you're feeling frustrated in relationship with another is what you're feeling, not labeling them for what's going on for you. So what we can do in terms of slaying your dragons with compassion is actually continue to speak our truth. Now, I was brought up by I've written about her in the book, Put My Poor Mum, Rest in Peace. Um, my, um, so I, my, my mum told white lies. She was very proud of telling white lies. I always tell white lies because I never want to hurt anybody. And so I grew up telling white lies and then they became grey lies. And then you know, occasionally there were black lies. But I grew up not thinking that telling lies was all right. And then um, um, I had a, a, an awakening experience where I realised that I didn't, I didn't want to speak, I didn't want to live in, 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 in not in truth anymore. And so I made a vow to myself. It's one of the things I do with myself. I make vows because I know that if I make a vow, I'm really, if I break the vow, I'm losing my connection with whatever my concept of the divine is. So the vow I made to myself was I will live in truth, which doesn't mean I never lie. Because if you try and do that, you'll probably, you know, I find myself sometimes cornered and telling a lie to escape from a situation. But in the main, I find it so refreshing that I'd no longer have to pretend to be something else. And what we can do in Slay Your Dragons with Compassion is to practice that art of authenticity and truth. And then you become someone who's trusted. Your word becomes trustworthy. You might be saying things sometimes that make people feel um, uncomfortable. That's their issue. But if you can be conscious of what it is you want to communicate and make a practice of getting your point across, but also of hearing what the other person's point is. So Stephen Covey in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks about um, one of the habits is seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. Now that's quite a profound um, statement. Seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. What it means is hear what the other one's got to say first. Don't be in too much of a rush to get your own uh, point of view across. So that's a very brief um, summary of some of this wonderful book, which is on sale at the moment through Amazon. So um, it, they've reduced the price to 9.35 for a limited period, which I learned from my publishers is a good sign. It means it's selling and actually mm -hmm. they're, they're looking to do bulk volume. So it's on sale at £9.35 9 at the moment through Amazon, but it won't stay that. 
it's coming out on Tuesday, so it'll be in the bookshops hopefully from then. Um, and uh, and um, uh, there's a, all this stuff that we're talking about is in this book. And, and I really feel like it, what I've done with this book is I've, I've actually, I have put, put together my philosophy and learning through my life, specifically through my daughter's death. Um, but also specifically through my groups, through the many people who've worked with me intensively. And there are quite a few in this, in this room who've done a lot of work with me. And I've watched them change. I mean, I am so, I, I'm so um, privileged to watch extraordinary shift in people. And I'm looking at, um, can I name any of you? Is that all right? So, um, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't. Okay, anyway, there's a few of you here in, the, in, this, in this space. Who, um, who have really educated me in your process and in your courage in going through the really difficult things that are around. And I'd love to name them, but I don't want to do that without your, um, without your permission. So I'm not going to do that. So it is coming up shortly to quarter to eight. And what I thought we'd do is spend maybe about, what do you think, about 12 minutes in a, in a breakout room. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll do groups of... Um, how many do you want in a group? Because we've got 39 people and you won't be in a group. So do you want five, four or six? I think if we're going to do, um, I think if we're going to do 12 minutes. I think we'll do four because I, I think I'd like to leave enough time that there's some, some reasonable meat on the bone rather than just ticking the box that everyone gets a share and that you actually do take your three minutes each. So there'll be 15 minutes altogether and you get three minutes each to talk about what struck you um, and uh, I just had something from Bob saying I can name him. Bob is here in Priya and Bob, and uh, Bob's done loads of groups with me and men's groups. And uh, he and I have wrestled, I don't mean physically, but, but emotionally over many, many a time. And, um, and I, I saw him come back for more each time, was really willing to face his own demons. And Bob, you've been an inspiration to me in so many oh. ways. As of thank, thank you, and I, I really miss I really miss those interactions between us. Yeah, that's great. Yes, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, I, I won't name anyone else unless they actually give me written permission down here in the chat box. Um, but I will if you if you want if you want, if you want to put something in the chat box for a second. I'll do that because then, then you're here. Anyone going once, going twice. Sold. Okay. Right. So we're going to go into small groups. Um, so um, we're going to take um, three minutes each. You'll need a timekeeper, and, um, and we're going to give you fifteen minutes. So at the end of your three minutes each, you've got a time to just to, to to round up together, and take your three minutes. Notice that when you take your space, don't rush to get your thoughts out. So take the first ten seconds of your three minutes by slowing down, by deep breathing by making eye contact with the others in your group. And then after your 10 or 12 seconds of that, then just talk about whatever struck you from the different things we've talked about this evening and what, you, um, what you're coming away with. And then we're gonna come back after these 15 minutes and I'm gonna then work with some of you in the, in the group for the final half hour of, the, um, of our session together. So any questions before we go into the groups? New message. Do we, what are we talking about in the group? We've just covered that. We just repeat. Yeah, what no, repeat it. Whatever you've been, um, um, whatever you've been in, whatever you've been touched by this evening, um, or whatever you've been stimulated by, talk about that. Which is the practice that, that speaks to you? Which is a practice that you haven't done? That might be there. Might be a revelation that you think, ah. Yes, I need to start forming my sangha. I need to create my community around me. Or actually, I'm willing to listen to my partner more. Or whatever it is, just take a look at what's around for you. Now, Priya and Bob have just sent me a message saying they're in a group together. I don't think we can split you up if you're on the same thing. So I think you're going to be in a, a group and it'll be done on a sort of a, um, yeah. uh, what's it called? Um, a, a random. random. So random. It's not the end of the world. If, if, it's, if you've got four in one group and three in another, it's okay. I don't want too many in a group because I do want space for people to have their, their three minutes. Okay. So take... uh, Malcolm, you won't be joining a group, will you? No, I can't. Okay. I'd like to join a group. I think Judy will as well. So I'm going to do uh, breakout rooms into four and then it was at random. Everybody, and then at 12 minutes, I'm going to give a one minute warning and everybody comes back. Okay. Is that all right? Yep. 
four minutes times three, and then when that's over, so I'll keep my eye on the time. Oh, sorry, 50, give them 15 minutes because they can do a roundup at the end of the 12 minutes. Okay. So give them 15 okay. minutes. So in 1945, so we're coming back at eight. I've got it. And, and uh, Gina will flag you back. Thank you uh, very much. Participants in automatically manually. Participants, sorry. It's giving me the option here for 45, four to five participants per three to four. Yeah. I'm going to do three to four per room. Do three so, to four. Yeah. yeah. Create backup rooms. 15 minutes. Okay. Oh, no rooms. Here That's we go. Teleported. I love this bit. All participants are all disappearing now. I'm going to put the recording on pause. Okay. Welcome Great. back, everyone. Malcolm, we're all back. Thank you, Gina, and thank you, everybody. Um, yes, Julia just said to me, it, it felt a bit, um, a bit rushed because people haven't read the book. And I was trying to get a lot in in a short space of time. And so you suggested, Julia, that we do another one once people have had a chance to read the book. So um, I'd be happy to do that, Judy, if, if, uh, and Gina, if that's uh, possible your end. Um, yeah, where's Judy? Yeah. We can talk about it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so well, let's, let's just have a look and see what's around. So. Um, so again, just take a moment. Let's find that moment of stillness before we dive into something. So just find the moment to just slow your breathing and take a look around this group of people. Here we are in a, a, a temporary sangha, a sangha for the evening. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to engage with you. I'm not quite sure what that means even at this stage. It, it's not just questions and answers. In, but don't do a soliloquy about your understanding the philosophy of, of the, the nature of the human race. Um, but just see if you can come back with something that you've, that's, that's around for you that you'd like to share that, that will feed into the space of, of, of all of us. So maybe we could do it. There's a thing on your, um, on your thing which says reactions. And if you do a raised hand, oh, yeah. um, then you can, like something like that, you can sort of show uh, that you, you, wanna, you wanna say something. So either that or a hand raised. Hello, Fika. Nice to see you. Is Fika is Fika speaking? Because you're muted, Fika. If you want to speak. Oh, yeah, you're muted. I so. said yes. Hello. I was hiding earlier, Malcolm. I didn't know that my camera was on. Yeah, it was nice to see you too. Uh, yes, excellent. Great. And hello, Emma. Haven't seen you yet for a bit. And hello, to everyone. I haven't. I won't try and do the the whole rounds of everybody. Um, um, okay, so who would like to say something? What came up for you? What are, what are you with? What have you, what have you Jacqueline's, got? So Jacqueline's got a thumb up. Who, sorry? Jacqueline Barron has her thumb up. Jackie, yes. Let's have you, Jackie. Muted. Unmute. Unmute yourself. Unmute. I've unmuted. Unmuted now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello everyone. Um, yeah, really, really good to see everyone and um, I really enjoyed that Malcolm, thank you. Um, I think what I was saying in the breakout group was what I found, what I've taken from what you said already is that I, I very much go on my intuition and my sixth sense um, and I've learned that, you know, the past decade but what I took from what you said was to actually stop, listen, and then move forward, as opposed to just listening and acting. So it's that that pre-act of stopping mm. um, that you reminded me. I, I know, but I'd forgotten, um, and and I I found that really helpful. That's great. Thank you, Jack. That's really useful. That's good feeding for the, for the group as a whole as well. Yeah, to take it is stop. So yeah. it's, a, it's a whole process of stop, tune yeah. in, and then respond rather than react. Yes. And if you're not ready to say, yeah, you know, I, I need a minute. I'm, I'm just going to take some time processing this here mm -hmm. and then, then do it. Yep. So, yeah. Thank you. It's a good one. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah. Anybody else has got their hand up? It's going to go to. Anybody else got a thumb or a hand? Wants to comment? I'm moving between two screens here. 
Nobody so far has got any comment. I think it, it, Barbara Lambert. Ah, yes. She's unmuted. Barbara, go ahead. Well, I, I've just found where my thumb was, so that's getting hold of the technology. You can do that as well. Okay, okay yeah, that would be a lot easier. <laughs> that's a thought. Um, I, I was introduced to the, the uh, concept of a sanger. I've never heard that word before. I get the drift and I, it was very valuable. It, it uh, fits for where I am in my life at the moment. I was explaining I want to create one or no, that's not right. I want to improve on the communications between the various members of my family sanger. And uh, so that's something I'll, I'll look into more. It's helpful to have it introduced. Mm. And, and do read Thich Nhat Hanh if you really want to see a master of, of a Sangha. He's, he's someone who's really worth speaking, uh, reading. And Jack Cornfield as well with a K. Right, thank you. And, and, and Malcolm, um, you know, for all people, many people are lonely and in lockdown particularly have missed connection. Um, and more Zoom. But I mean, the Zoom aspect has brought me so much community. <clears throat> this is my physical community but I've made some great connections and taken the time to do that not just listening to a lecture but I mean conversations like this and they've nourished me so you know as much as we love to have that physical community you know you can always reach out can't you and find other people yeah to be in community with in times of difficulty like we're in now exactly. and then you know go to places like Conscious Cafe or Alternatives or Findorn or um, Jack Cornfield's website or Tara Brack's website. Even just five friends and a cup of tea. Perfect. <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, Catherine. Yeah. Unmute. Um, so I think that's a really valid point. Um, I belong to Conscious Cafe in uh, the New Forest with Anne Jones, who is wonderful. Um, but but we've taken it a layer further. We have um, the Power Four or Power Three, whatever you have a group together. Um, for exactly that reason that ultimately you can do it as a group like this but it's that ongoing connection um, so we've got like-minded people hi Malcolm you probably don't recognize me <laughs> it's been a long time and and nice to see Fika and Mark as well from from the group six seven years ago oh I do I now remember you yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you should do you probably got the bruises still <laughs> you were powerful in that group I remember you very well yeah yeah well, I've had a few life epiphanies since then. Um, and uh, yeah, been a very interesting journey for the last six years. Um, so yeah, it was lovely to, to come and do it. And, and actually the one that resonated me in the group was Slay Your Dragons with Compassion. I was explaining to the group that, uh, you know, I'm still, you know, in my, in my work environment, I'm still the boss and I'm still telling people what to do and how to do it. Um, and I, you know, I need to, uh, I need to listen more before I, you know, before I dictate what they do or don't do. Um, so uh, that was it. That was an interesting one to to relearn. I think my my biggest question is, uh, uh, without being arrogant, I know a lot of this stuff, but it is that pause and breathe beforehand. And when you're in the heat of the moment, how the hell do you do that? I'm still struggling with that one, Malcolm. I am a thousand times better than I ever was, but how do you remember to breathe and pause? So again it's a practice and it's a muscle that you stretch every time you remember it i was listening to one of um, sharon salzberg's meditations on breathing she does a 10 minute meditation on inside timer um which is about following one breath and she said it doesn't matter if you miss it ten thousand times you still go for the practice the practice mm -hmm. is start at the beginning of the breath follow it all the way through look at where the inhale stops and where the exhale begins and follow that through and that's that's a, like a beautiful meditation so, so at the moment where you find yourself doing what you normally do, of jumping in and, and not slowing down and, and, uh, and trying to sort things instantly, that moment where there's a possibility of taking a shift and saying, stop, breathe. Mm. That will make, and, you know, you get it wrong 10,000 times, that's okay. Yeah, but the, you, get it wrong, you get it right once and then funnily enough, the next 10,000, you'll get it right twice, won't you? So exactly and so then that's that's evolution you know that mm. we actually do we, we we keep the process of practice alive yeah lovely Gita has her hand up yes Gita, and then after that ben lovely hi um the sangha i created my own sangha when i moved to where i live now which is almost five years ago 
and I knew I wanted to create community and gradually it unfolded and we, we meet regularly and in the and we are close enough for most of us to be walking distance so when we had the lockdown we were once we were allowed to meet we were able to meet without having to use public transport <laughs> having to catch the tube or anything and just meet in the local park so that's been wonderful and I also belong to some some other groups and uh, and we were talking in my breakout about the importance of being with people who are not like you so you get like different ideas you can be challenged provoked um, have discussion which leads me to something I didn't agree with you about the relationships about being in the world together I think it's quite healthy for couples to have some different interests that they could share with their other friends and give each other a little bit of space because otherwise there's this tendency to look at the partner as the one-stop shop the person is going to fulfill all your needs and I mean the, the pressure on that one person is immense and I think that's why in my humble opinion I think that's why some relationships fall apart because of the pressure of expectation. I, I think that's spot on, Geeta, and I, and I don't disagree with you. So I think you're, um, I think you're right there. But uh, there's, and in fact, the I Ching, which is um, the Chinese, the Chinese oracle, which Confucius said he starts to grasp the rudimentaries of when he was seventy, um, <laughs> says that the, the potential for a relationship when you've got two people who are like each other is is a lot easier. And the, then the, the potential for a relationship with people, two people who are quite different, but the, the potential within that difference is where a, a relationship can really um, be and stretch. I'm not suggesting you have to think the same way and be joined to the hip and mm. answer all each other's problems. I'm saying that you have to have a basic understanding at each of the levels in order to be able to relate. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's useful. Thank you, Gita. And um, who did you say wants to follow in Gita? Oh, uh, Ben. Ben. Right, Ben. Yeah. Hi, Malcolm. I was going to ask, uh, in relation to the situation that happened with yourself. Ben, um, we've got a problem listening to you. Ben, we can't really. Ben, Ben. Transitional period in life. Ben, uh, maybe take your video off because we cannot hear the audio. If you can hear me, speak again, but maybe- can you hear me now? Yeah. Perhaps a bit better, try again. One second. Can you hear now? Yes. yes. <clears throat> Hello, Ben, calling Ben. I don't know what kind of connection we're on, Ben. Should we go to the next person? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Ben, good idea to text. But... Uh, okay. I was going to ask uh, Malcolm with the situation that happened to you um, and also with the people who are going to transitional periods in a life or transformational periods either. Uh, Did you get any of that, Malcolm? <clears throat> no. Ben, write your message there because we'd love to hear it. We've got a, we've got a quarter, but not all, obviously the three quarters that makes it understandable. So um, somebody else had their hand raised. I'm looking for that person because it says two more people. Um, asked, who, oh, uh, Priya and Bob, you've got your hands raised, so I'm unmuting you. Okay, okay. You, you, Priya, uh, Bob, I can't hear you, just that's it. Okay. Got um, you. Actually, Malcolm, I hope you're not offended by my saying this, but actually a really important thing I got had nothing to do with what Malcolm said, but what Jackie said. And it was something about, I don't remember the exact words, but it was about, you got a reminder. And one of the things that I find so difficult is, I think myself, I know so much about how I should, how 
the good stuff. You know, I've got years and years and years of Malcolm teaching me stuff, but I forget it. I forget it. And I don't know the best way to be reminded. So the things you said, Malcolm, to me, they weren't really new, but they were reminders. I, you know, I think, oh, God, I, I forgot that. So that's very frustrating to me where I've got the tools, I've got the knowledge, and I tend to forget it. Uh, so, Malcolm, this has been a wonderful uh, chance for me to remember things again. And Jackie, thank you for, uh, uh, you know, triggering me on that. That's all. Thank you. And, and, you know, the thing is, we're not looking at deeply complex things here. We're looking at simple practices, which if they're, if they're done, we get the sense of, of how to function in the world a, a little, with, with a little more ease than we have done. Mm -hmm. The, the more you talk about things though, Malcolm, isn't it? The more you, you're constantly reminded and we kind of, when somebody shares, like we had the opportunity just to share for a few minutes, somebody will share a story and we go, yeah, I've got that as well. It's nice to be reminded. Constant thing, you know, unless you have it on a piece of paper in front of you. It's just that constant dialogue, being mindful, having the time to reflect and having conscious conversations with people about things that matter. There's a, there's a book um, that, I, that touched me very deeply back in my, my, in my 20s, which was Aldous Huxley's Island. And, um, and in Ireland, it's a utopian society. And uh, this um, man is thrown up on the beach of this island and um, comes from the sort of like, you know, the worldly space and then comes to this utopian society. And one of the things that happens on the island is there are minor birds on the island and they are constantly calling out attention, attention. And it's a reminder to pay attention. And I know when I did a five day retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh, every hour there would be a bell that would be rung and that you would stop for five seconds, whatever you were doing, and you would pay attention. So we can set up our own reminders. We can have our own little aid memoirs to actually sort of help ourselves to get to, to, to be in the place where we're willing to be conscious around. Yeah. The Brahma Kumaras do that every hour, they have just a minute, 60 seconds. Oh, perfect. And then it's like a traffic light. You either run the car all day or every hour the traffic light, you just stop. We've got Ben's text here. Shall I read it to you, Malcolm? Yes, please. Um, he's going to ask you, with your situation or others going through a transitional slash transformation in their life, i.e. from the known past to the improved future, how would you suggest a balance between acceptance and how much one should or could self-develop? as there is a likely tendency to focus on the latter. I think this is a sort of, um, is, these are interconnected actually. So I think that if we're wise, then we, we will learn to roll with the punches. We won't just sort of, we won't fight against everything that's happening to us or wish it was different. So there is something about acceptance, but there is also something about self-development that as we develop different aspects of ourselves, we become much more able to manage things and one of the things that I, I teach and I work with is it's not what happens to you that counts. It's how you respond to what happens to you. And that's the practice is, is that actually when things happen, you know, do you get a sleepless night over it? Do you, you know, agonize over it? Or do you find ways of sitting with it, being still and coming to peace and acceptance with it? Let's see if we have any other hands. Laura had a hand raised, did she? I'm looking for a hand raise. Um, looking. Cora, oh, I can see. Uh, yes, Cora. Cora, I'm going to unmute you, Cora. No, hang on, Cora, you're I now unmuted. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um. Uh, yeah. So, th thank you so much, Malcolm. That was really is really interesting, and uh, the thing that I loved was the way you bring in all those different uh, spiritual teachers, which seem to uh, all ones that I've touched on, the Ram Das from Thich Nhat Hanh and Dalai Lama, the Bible. <laughs> I love that sort of richness and a way, and I think um, this, this thing of it is all a reminder. I've read all those things. I've listened to, you know, podcasts and things from Eckhart Tolle, and it's still good to be reminded to be present. And in one of our, in our groups, one of the, um, one of the people in the group was saying how that reminder about being with somebody as well, just, you know, if they're, if, you know, if they're distressed and upset and, you know, and that's the thing that, though we know 
it's good to do that. It's really hard. And that is, that was another good, they were all really good reminders. Um, they, they were sort of, and I, I, I love being reminding about the radar, about the sort of, because it's something I've been trying more and more to sort of tune into. Very, it's, it's sort of very difficult, but I think that, and it's strengthened, it is strengthened by coming to something like this, where, you know, it was something I was thinking about at the weekend, trying to just be more in touch and my intuition. But, you know, most of the day I didn't even think about it. And now, you know, I'm coming back and I'm going to, it'll just strengthen it. So as you say, it's like a, it's like a muscle, which we, we just have to, have to work with. And uh, so, you know, all, all very useful. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Yeah. See you. And a lot of the things, you know, people saying, um, Malcolm, that you've reminded them of things they know and that perhaps they haven't done enough and useful reminders. But also sometimes that we can be unconsciously competent in something. We don't realize we have that skill and naming it. So talking about it and, and think, oh, yeah, I do that. Yes. Kind of bring more attention to it, because I think it's quite clear, isn't it, that what's happened in the last few months has really called on us to find within us all of us skills and resources that we might not have used for a while or we didn't know we had um, to, to, to kind of build our resilience because we seem to be in a change of life for quite some time so many things changing so many things to cope with and um, you know what you've broken down in your book is these small sections of people to get their heads around to as you say how to be a psychotherapist and who would have thought that you can help yourself, you know, you can ask, asking yourself the question is a tool in itself, isn't it? Because you don't need to know the answer. You just have to simply ask the question and then whatever resources you've got within that pulls out of us. So I think anything that helps us be resilient and we keep talking, we, we realize that we've got quite a lot of skills. Yeah. Yes. Haven't we? Let's just see if there's any final questions in the Thanks. last few minutes. Crazy. Tracy, I'm going to unmute you, Tracy. I'm unmuting you. I'm unmuting you. Uh, asked to unmute. Hang on. Okay. Mute. You're there, Tracy. Got you. Yeah. Hi. Oh, God. I wasn't going to say anything, Malcolm. And then I'm just feeling this overwhelming feeling of uh, gratitude and appreciation. I mean, the, the group I was in, it's with three women I'd never met before, but it felt like an immediate sanger. There was an honesty and trust there. And my at the risk of sounding like I'm just part of your fan club. Um, you know, I, I want to say you give so much to so many. I mean, you've really done so much for me in my life and, and it's not just how I am as a person, it's how I am in my job and everything. And, um, um, and now you've written this book and, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm kind of slightly lost the words, but I just have this immense overwhelming feeling of gratitude for what you have given so many, I can't actually even see you on my screen, so I don't know how you're taking this, but, um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that, and I'm not going to say anything more, but thank you, Malcolm, for everything. And it's actually, you've just named something that's really important as well. Um, I was talking to a um, friend of mine the other day, and, and he was saying, let's support each other in doing a practice of gratitude. So the first thing we do when we wake up, let's spend, even if it's two minutes, what are we, what are we grateful for in our lives? And I, and I, I really like that practice of gratitude. So you've just, you just reminded me of that, Tracy. That actually, there is so much that we can be grateful for. You know, that, that our lives are rich, and that there is, this is a, an extraordinary journey that we're on. It's temporary. You know, we are going to become dust in, in the end. But um, along the way, we may be touched by such masters as Leonard Cohen or Thich Nhat Hanh or Herman Hesse or Aldous Huxley. And and all the time, we're getting some inspiration. But all the time also we're starting to create communities where there is a practice of becoming more human and looking for the next stage of evolution, which I believe we're on the verge of as well. Mm, beautiful. Well, we're almost over and we don't seem to have any more questions. And perhaps unless you have a final thought, that was a nice final thought. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Malcolm, as we... Yeah, I'd like to actually. I'd like to close with because um, what I did when I was writing the book was that I started collecting, which I've been doing for years anyway, um, a lot of quotes. And so every chapter in the book has got a quote at the beginning. And this is the quote from this is probably my favourite spiritual teaching. And um, this is a quote from George Bernard Shaw. Uh, this is on the track and the chapter called "Find Your Purpose." 
This is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. The being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle for me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I have got hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Malcolm, what a beautiful thought. Um, that lovely image of the candle. And if you're not too, too thoroughly used up, yes, I am sure, we talk to Judy, we'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to have you back Thank and you. have another conversation because this has been a lovely evening of remembering what we know and reminders. That's of, the thing. There are, you know, there are great secrets, but actually the bottom yeah. line is we know and actually yeah. we just have to keep it yeah. alive in us rather yeah. than withering on the vine. Yeah. And usually within that, there is something that right now is needed. And from among all those things, there's something comes up to be used. So Malcolm, thank you so much for taking us on this lovely journey this evening and um, bringing our community together in this way. Um, thank you. And thanks everybody for being here tonight. We have another event in a month's time on the 20th of October. And I feel actually it, it quite neatly follows on from this because we've got um, an evening with Phil Clothier. Uh, from the Barrett Value Centre. If you remember, we've had Richard Barrett talk with us before. What uh, Phil's going to talk about is how our values have shifted, in, particularly in the last few months. Research that they've done have shown um, among organisations where they have this audit of values that as they see things shift and change, things that they would expect to happen over seven years have been ha happened in, in weeks earlier this year. So it's an opportunity uh, 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 under their guidance to look at our own values and see what's changed within us. I think it'll be a lovely evening. That's on the 20th. So with that at 8.29, I think we have a nice, neat finish. And once again, thanks everybody for coming. And a huge thank you, Malcolm. Beautiful. And, 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 and do note that I know some of you have been taking notes, but um, Malcolm's book is available on Amazon at a special price now. So that seems like a, a good opportunity. And endorsed by Eckhart Tolle, which I'm so pleased about. Oh, how lovely. Oh, what a treasure that man is. How yeah. lovely to have his endorsement. <laughs> I've just posted the George Bernard Shaw com um, comment in the, um, in, uh, on the, um, what's it called? Um, chat. Chat box. I put that down there. So if you look on the chat box, and and also everyone will be sent a recording. So the, if you look up um, George, uh, the top twenty. Look at the link, quotes. Malcolm. That's mm -hmm. a lovely. It's a beautiful quote. We could put the link to it on the on the on the note that goes out with the recording. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's come from the um, um, George Bernard Shaw quotes. Anyway, I just I just, I just yeah. googled it just now. It's easy to find. Yeah, it's a famous quote. It's beautiful. Yes. Well, everybody, you can unmute yourself if you want to go. Woo! Bye. <laughs> Thank uh, you, We can have a big, big wish to go, really. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 B